Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Happy you've chose us to spend a little time together before we get into the perennial plants that like poor soil. Let's talk a little bit about bees with our good friends at Honey Bee Healthy. Since 2000, Honey Bee Healthy Inc. has helped beekeepers maintain healthy and thriving hives. Attracting pollinators to your garden this year is as simple as hanging a hummingbird feeder with a mixture of sugar water and honeybee healthy original. Don't be alarmed to see birds, bees, and butterflies butterflies dining together at the feeder. Pollinators coexist peacefully. Honeybee Healthy is offering a 10% discount of 8-ounce bottle of honeybee healthy original to this show's listeners. Enter discount code BGARDEN, that's B-E-E GARDEN. At checkout for more information, you can go to honeybeehealthy.com. Perennial plants, those are the ones that come back year after year. Annuals are ones that uh, last one uh, growing season, not to may insult anybody, but the to get everybody on the same page of understanding the terminology there. We're going to go over several that uh, will do good in poor soil. We don't all have pristine beds or lawns or components of soil in our backyard, so we have to deal and work with what we got. So... Let's start with bee balm. So a lot of these are tend to be native plants, which is good, um, which is positive. You want to plant native plants. So bee balm. But your, your, your mileage may vary based on your native plant area. Right. So bee balm is also known as wild bergamot, and it can grow almost anywhere. It's good through zones three to nine. It does grow well in poor quality soils, um, and... Partial to full sun. Partial so to full sun. That, that takes care of everybody there. Yeah, uh, and it's, so I know a lot of times people have um, problems, you know, one problem area of their garden, maybe it's that spot between the the sidewalk and the road, and just it's, uh, maybe it's a high traffic area, stuff just doesn't do well. A lot of times these plants will do well because they are either native, or they grow in poor soil, they're just meant to thrive. They're very so these, versatile and yeah, tough. Yeah, they're tough. So you could plant. Like a good woman. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the next one is, and you can always, you know, look these up. So that was bee balm. Blue star, blue star is another one. Blue star is really cute. It is kind of blue. It kind of um, looks like some of the plants we have up at our property. There's yeah. a flower up there that we wasn't able to identify, but side note. 3 to 11 in the zone, so that pretty much takes care of everybody. 2 to 3 foot tall and wide, so this takes up a good chunk of space. So this may not be the uh, ideal plant to put between the sidewalk and the road, that type area, because it will encroach onto the the walkway. And uh, anything that encroaches on the walkway, if you're in the city, uh, you are responsible for that. And if somebody trips and falls... You're responsible for that because you caused I, yeah, issues. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I I wouldn't sit here and quote yeah. legalities, uh, uh, well, but anyway, um, yeah. Be, so this be, is be cautious of what you plant, where you plant. Uh, partial okay shade to full sun and uh, chunky clay, sandy or loamy soil. So it kind of is, and it has a large tap root. So that's probably why it does well in poor soil. It reaches down deep. Yeah. Um, uh, on that, so butterfly weed, very pretty flower that you can incorporate into your property. Zone orange. St- uh, orange. I don't know why I said yellow. Uh, zone three to nine, one to two foot tall, one and a half, one to one and a half foot wide. So a good little compact plant, full sun. So that's your your ca- your your uh, warning. This is only a full sun plant. Uh, so uh, does well in uh, many types of soil, including clay and sand. And that's the thing. When you see a plant that will do well in clay soil or sandy soil, that means if you do have good soil on your property, it's going to do well too. It's not like, you know, oh, it's great soil. I'm going to die. I'm not going to grow here. So it, it, you can see that, and that's a good thing to pay attention to whenever you're looking for the uh, requirements or the, the, the recommendations for what grows best in what type of soil. So the next one is common yarrow. This is a yellow one. So that's that's the color yellow. Okay. You know, if you're gonna make a little make a little garden, you wanted to have some contrast. You could do the blue star and the common yarrow, the blue with the yellow. Colors of the rainbow. Very. Um, yeah. Exactly. So it's very hardy. It's people will. I guess it's been seen blooming on old copper mines in Colorado. So there you go. There you KHNC thirteen sixty. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so it's, it is, it does get two to three feet tall, a foot and a half to two feet wide, not terribly wide zones, three to nine. And this is a full sun to part shade and a loomy or a sandy soil. Daylilies. Now this is the, you want, this is the plant that it seems like everybody seems to grow. Everybody you go to has at least a daylily. They're in front of, you know, city hall. They're in front of churches. They're in front of daylilies. Uh, multitude of different colors. I mean, you can pick any color you want. They've, their daylily probably comes and in that color. there's varieties. There, yeah. There'll be ones that are like kind of purpley on the outside and white on the inside. I don't like daylilies. I think they're kind of ugly. I think they're they're too bulky. Yeah. Uh, and when I say it can get uh, six inches to five and a half foot tall based on the variety and two to four foot wide. And it, it appears, and, and at your mom's, uh, uh, residence she has uh, them growing along the side of the house and no matter how many times you dig them up or you try to, to, to get rid of them they come back stronger and stronger so uh, can prefer full sun but can tolerate partial shade and manage and and is good in sandy and clay soil but yeah they, they are very resistant plants but you can get very smaller, compact ones or the very large ones that many of us may be familiar with. But like you said, a, a, a pick a color and that's, they, you can find a daylily in that color. Absolutely. So um, the next one is false indigo. And this is a larger plant. It has, um, it kind of looks like the plant structure of lavender a little bit. It is a bluish color and it's, Good options for zone three to nine, partial to full sun. Does a, it has a taproot as well, and I think it's part of the legume family. Let me just double check here. Um, yeah, so it's it is part of the legume family. So which is like a bean, basically. It's not a bean itself. It's not going to produce beans, but it's part of that that family um, origination. Goldenrod. Now you can see goldenrod in the ditches in the country roadsides pretty much anywhere especially this time of year later in summer and early fall it is just a blanket of yellow bright color and it's a tall long stemmed plant zones four to eight two to three foot tall foot and a half to two foot wide requires full to partial sun and and we have we see that a lot in our travels and there's just you know open meadows meadows of goldenrod as far as the eye can see in some places and the bees are incredibly attracted to oh, yeah. this oh, yeah. uh, due to they're running out of well they're not running out but it is an easy food source now in the late portions of summer early fall absolutely goldenrod if you're not familiar um it, it can it can spread so keep that in mind might be a good but if option. you're looking for a native just, yeah. you know, a metal that you just want to go into a native stand state goldenrod once you plant you're gonna you're gonna be good to go on that so cone flowers um these are cute little plants that the bees also love i've seen the bees you know being very friendly with them they are a native eastern eastern northern america plant i know i've seen them here in the midwest and they have a a few different colors as well they have um a range of colors they're more of a petally flower so if you like something that is a large center with smaller petals around yeah, yeah. Reminds you like of a daisy, you know, a petal flower like that. Cone flowers are that they do need the full sun. So keep that in mind. They, they really want that full sun. Now, lavender is a plant in which you can grow uh, full sun. And uh, it is it does well in most soils, zone 5, two, 5A to 9A. Um, so as the USDA re-racked the growing zones this past spring, that should include a few more people. It can get two to three foot tall and spread to two to four foot wide. Now, this is one plant, and uh, it is a plant that will come back year after year and continue to grow and create a carpet of foliage or, or vegetation in an area that otherwise may not do very well. Now, the issue that we have had growing lavender in our garden as just a annual is the germination. We have had very difficult challenges in order to get the lavender to germinate. So if you have been one of those gardeners, getting lavender from the garden center that is already growing 
may be the best and only option you have instead of trying to wrestle with the trying to get the seeds to germinate. And once you establish it in an area, then it can it will maintain itself for many years to come. Full sun is what it requires as well. There you go, lavender. Um, so another one is New England aster. So many people are familiar with asters. There's a lot of varieties, but the New England one um, does well in the poor soil. It does provide a lot of nectar for fall pollinators and you do want to give them space to to grow they can um they need they don't want to be cramped i think that's i'm pretty sure it's all asters but this one is for sure you don't want to cramp them give them space to grow and they will thrive and do well they i know they are um they are different aster varieties are native to the united states in general so keep that in mind uh generally four to eight in the zones there uh rosemary perennial uh perennial herb that will come back year after year now the thing with this is oh i oh i didn't know rosemary would come back year after year i never been able to get it grow you might be thinking that and you are not able to grow it year after year and have it as a perennial because it's zone eight to ten so it's kind of, it's more of a southern a perennial than a northern perennial where most of our stations are at two to four six a uh, two to six foot tall it can get and can grow up to two to four foot wide and requires full sun it will uh, grow in rocky and infertile soil um, very easily so it is a warmer perennial so keep that in mind now if you're able to let's say you have uh, some rosemary growing uh, you are you can uh, overwinter it in the form of you know putting some straw bales around it and and covering it with some um, uh, row covers in order to try to keep it warmer than the environment around it is to try to overwinter it. That is an option as well. All right. So then we also have mountain mint, and this one spans grow zones from two to eight. So two is not one we see a lot. Um, for grow zones that, that is cold yeah it is cold and it has silvery green leaves and then it has these like whitish pinkish blooms it does have more of a shallow root system but because of that it has the ability to access what it needs um, easily and does well with the the uh, sh the shallow root system that it has it can grow in clay sandy or loamy soil that is dry medium or moist so that's probably why it does well in zone two it's it sounds like it's pretty hardy yeah well those are just some perennials in which it will work in poor soil and holly summer is over in most places the nights are getting colder the kids are back in school but you've forgotten about your lawn and if you have done that you're going to have problems come this spring just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards and those Japanese beetles either. They may be gone, but they're not far. Not only do they feast on your roses and berries this summer, they laid eggs on your turf so you can start again next year. Take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gun. Grub Gun is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets scarab pests and their larvae. Simply apply the granule with a spreader, irrigate it into the soil, and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gun easy to use, but the best part about it, it's a non-chemical choice. It's the only non-chemical choice to effectively control control grubs and the best part about it, it is non-toxic to bees and other beneficial insects and pollinators so you don't have to worry about them picking up the toxicity that other chemicals would leave and they toxify their home and hives you can find all this out at grub gone from phylum bioproducts.com that's p-h-y-l-l-o-m bioproducts.com the natural choice